Hello everyone, you're watching the channel Stories of Our Life. Friends, make yourselves comfortable. I wish you to truly enjoy listening to this life story. The woman opened the door and quickly stepped into the office. She headed toward the CEO's office, but the secretary, like a guardian, stood in the visitor's way and asked sternly, Do you have an appointment? No, the visitor was taken aback, but then tried to move the secretary out of her way with the words, I don't need a special invitation. Do you even know who I am? I don't care who the Pope is. What is your business? Jill, with a sigh, sank back in her chair and said quietly, My husband, John Leonard, is the director of the finance department. He's gone on a business trip and still hasn't returned. I need to find out from the CEO what he knows about this. Mr. Sharp went home 20 minutes ago. It is Friday, after all. He won't be back until Monday. That's when you should come in. Unless, of course, your husband returns himself before then, the secretary explained. Jill left the reception area and walked slowly down the long corridor toward the exit. Her husband did not return the next day, Monday, or the week after. He had disappeared. There was no call or message from him. Her little daughter asked about daddy every day, and Jill explained to her, as best she could, how important daddy's job was. Jill went to the police, filed a missing persons report. Jill's parents took little Emily to their house while they searched. They thought it would be easier for their daughter that way. When she was left alone in an empty apartment, it only got worse. All kinds of bad thoughts crept into her head. The only consolation was that the search for him was underway. True, there were no results as yet. And would there be any results at all? They had met John seven years before. She had noticed the handsome boy at school and realized she had fallen in love with him. She liked everything about him. She liked his smile, his laugh, the timbre of his voice. Jill dreamed that this handsome man would pay attention to her. To her he was the standard of male beauty, but it seemed that he did not notice anyone at all. One day something happened that changed her life dramatically. Jill literally ran out of the institute building because she was in a hurry. She and the girls had arranged to go to the movies in the evening. She needed to get some things done in time. Quickly running down the steps, Jill stood in the fluffy snow, which covered the ice. Immediately she fell. The laughter all around was loud. The girl was ready to fall to the ground with shame. She had spotted John in the crowd of boys as soon as she was on the street. She wanted to look as attractive as possible, but now she was a hundred percent sure that he had definitely noticed her. She almost cried from annoyance. And her hip ached terribly. Suddenly someone reached out for her hand, and the most beautiful voice in the world sounded above her ear. Can I help you? Jill looked up. Exactly. She couldn't be wrong, it was John. The guy helped her up. While she shook herself off, he gathered up her textbooks back into the bag and offered to walk her out. Of course, she couldn't refuse, because she certainly wouldn't get a second chance. They walked slowly. He carefully supported her under his arm. Jill rejoiced. She was ready to forget all the business in the world. Forget the movies, forget her friends, just so their journey would never end. After they reached the house and sat down on a bench outside the house, she said, Thank you, John. I don't know what I would have done without you. She wanted to say something else, but his phone rang, and after smiling, the guy stepped aside, and after talking and coming back, said, I've got to go. Can you make it to the apartment on your own? Jill nodded. John, after saying, goodbye, quickly went about his business. Since then, they always said hello, often chatted when they met, and a couple of times he invited her to a cafe near the institute for coffee, and then walked her home. She was happy. She adored listening to him. She felt like she could sit and listen to him for the rest of her life. He was incredibly talented. John was the kind of man who could do anything he set his mind to. He never sat through anything with books, like Jill, for example. He had enough to attend lectures, and he knew all the material. 
Jill, on the other hand, had to learn everything by heart at night to get good grades. They started dating in the third year. John was invited to work in the department. Jill's parents really liked the guy, good for you, daughter. John is a very nice young man. Now I have peace of mind for you, her father used to say to her all the time. Jill was flattered by her father's words. She was saddened by only one thing. John was not the only one she liked. All the girls were crazy about him. But despite the fact that John had an even relationship with everyone, Jill was jealous. One day she shared her worries with her mother. She replied, Dash a daughter, but he is not your husband. Why torture yourself? You also know that he is handsome, and with such never just happens. You have to be ready for that. If you're sure you can hold on to a man like that, then don't worry. And if you can't hold on to him, you better stop everything now and find someone for yourself. It will be easier and more peaceful for you. For a long time the girl pondered her mother's words and realized that her parent was right about many things. If now I go crazy just because John smiled at someone, then what will happen next? I mean, he hasn't even told me that he loves me. But I can't lose him either, she pondered. Yes, she loved John, but she could not admit it to him. She decided that he should figure it out himself. He was clever, after all. She wished he were hers alone, but he had other plans for her. Somehow, after examining herself critically in the mirror, Jill came to the conclusion that she was not ugly, but not beautiful either. It was obvious. The short haircut suited her very well. She had big eyes, an upturned nose. Separately, all the body parts seemed to be beautiful, but when they were put together, there was something wrong. It was like a jigsaw puzzle that didn't fit together right. The picture seemed to come together, but it wasn't the same. Of course, her mother and father always told her that she was the prettiest, but they were biased, they were parents. However, in my fourth year at New Year's Eve, John kissed Jill for the first time. It was an incredible feeling. Of course, it wasn't her first kiss, but everything before that had been childish. And this kiss was adult. It was so deep that it took my breath away. My head was dizzy from the wine. Jill tried her best to respond to this passionate kiss, but John only laughed. It turns out you don't know how to kiss at all. I know. But I feel very good with you, John, the girl replied embarrassedly. You mean you like being with me when I kiss you, the guy smiled slyly. Do I have to profess my love for you? Is there such a need? Jill looked into his eyes and didn't know what to answer. Then she remembered that if there's nothing to say, you should always tell the truth, and quickly said, Yes, I really like you. At the beginning of her fifth year, John proposed to Jill. The girls in the course were openly saying that they didn't understand the guy at all. What does he see in her? Seriously? Why did he choose such mediocrity? It's always like that, if a guy is more or less handsome, then he chooses some bogeyman, was indignant the main beauty of the group. John's parents took Jill in right away. They had the wedding in a cafe and partied until morning. Of course, Jill knew that family life is not always easy. There were bound to be quarrels and resentments. But she had no idea that she would be so quickly confronted with her husband's infidelity. For a long time, meeting her husband from work, she could not understand what was wrong. One day it hit her. You smell like another man's woman, she declared to her husband. She looked at John so shrewdly that it seemed to him that she could see right through him. For the first time he was afraid. But he was not afraid of being exposed. No. He was afraid he was going to lose her. After that, their relationship soured. Jill slept in her daughter's room more and more often. And when her husband tried to tell her his grievances, she slapped him in the face. Dash, are you crazy? You think I can't hit you back, I yelled John. You can. Only I don't deserve it. I realized a long time ago that you were cheating on me. But I don't intend to share you with anyone or forgive you for your cheating. Decide what you will do next, because it can't go on like this, the wife replied nonchalantly. She went to the closet and pulled out a bag of things she had prepared in advance. 
Where are you going, wondered John. The woman walked silently to the front door, opened it, and turned to her husband, I'm not going anywhere. But you're going away. There are your things in the bag. I can't see you, much less sleep with you. Something has to change in our lives. And you have to decide how you're going to live your life. Will you live with me and my daughter or separate from us? John freaked out and quickly left the apartment. He did not take the bag. In the back of his mind, the man hoped his wife would come to her senses and call him, but his wife silently slammed the door behind him. John went to his friend's house because his parents were on his wife's side. A week went by. He missed his daughter and he missed Jill. During that time, John realized he had no one closer than them. A month later, he was ready on his knees to ask his wife's forgiveness for what he had done. They talked for a long time. All the while, Jill never once looked at him. John had already lost all hope of forgiveness, but suddenly she turned to him and said, Now, of course, you're making a good point. And I beg you to mark my words, you won't get a second chance. Then John was over the moon. He was able to regain the family he had almost lost through his own stupidity. He was sure that all the hardships were behind him, but how wrong the man was. Two months after their reconciliation, John received the call he least wanted to hear right now. You must come to me now. I have very important information for you, the woman said dryly. Can't you tell me on the phone, wondered John. He had absolutely no desire to travel this far to find out anything curious. You don't understand. I don't just want to give you this news. I want to see your eyes after hearing it. You're pregnant, whispered John. He felt the blood rush to his face. You're very intuitive, the woman laughed into the phone. Nancy, I'm not an 18-year-old boy anymore. I know that sex on the side can have its consequences. That's why I use protection. I do it all the time. I have nothing to do with your baby. Good. Then I'll tell daddy that you dash, Nancy replied suspiciously calmly. You're blackmailing me, he didn't let her finish. No. I just really want to see you, she sounded like she was smiling. Okay. I'll come as soon as I can. But definitely not right now. I'm at work, the man sighed and turned off his phone. Nancy Smart was the only daughter of the deputy CEO of a science center. After he took over as head, the science center became promising started attracting foreign specialists and engaged in very interesting developments. That is why John Leonard, a notable scientist, was a frequent guest at this hospitable center. Nancy appeared quite unexpectedly when John and Mr. Smart were having lunch at the restaurant. Hi, Daddy. Just a second, Nancy kissed her father on the cheek, listen, send money to the card, it's zero, but upon noticing John, the young woman immediately changed her plans, would you mind if I had a bite to eat with you? The father couldn't hold back a smile. He knew his daughter all too well. Meet Nancy, this is John, a future distinguished scientist. She stared at him with her blue eyes without the slightest shadow of shyness. She was only 19, but she was so uninhibited that John could only wonder how her father put up with it all. She took the man to bed herself. He didn't even have to make any effort. He understood that at her age he was far from her first. She didn't ask for anything, she didn't make any conditions, they just had sex without any strings attached. What man could resist that? John decided not to pass up such an opportunity and just make a variety in family life. John never hid the fact that he was married, that he had a growing daughter and was not going to leave them. Nancy was happy with everything, which made the man incredibly happy. Now every time he came on a business trip to the research center, his young partner arranged a fairy tale weekend for him. She was the woman with whom it is impossible to get bored. However, this was only temporary. And now this woman decided to go for blackmail. John would no longer return Nancy's phone calls. One day he texted her, explaining that there was no point in calling her to begin with, he had promised her nothing. Whose baby it is, she has to find out for herself and he would come when he saw fit. 
Soon Jill's phone received pictures of John in his arms with Nancy. His wife forwarded them to her spouse's phone with comments that he was very photogenic. With much effort, John was able to convince his wife that this was all three months ago, that he had already apologized to her for the transgression, and they had worked it out. Jill seemed to believe it. And now it was time to go on a business trip to the Science Center. For himself, John decided that with Nancy it would be their last conversation that would end their relationship. A month had passed since the business trip, and John still hadn't returned. Jill went to the police as if she were going to work, but they would only helplessly shake their hands, searching. We have put ads about your husband's disappearance all over the city and on the internet. But so far there have been no results, they kept telling her every time. Did you go to the science center? Did you find out there? Jill persisted. Yes. An employee of ours went and talked to Mr. Smart personally. Smart. He assured our employee that your husband had taken care of everything, and they said their goodbyes. He was perfectly healthy and was going home, she heard back. But a man can't go missing without a trace. Isn't there anyone who saw him the day he left? Have you had cases like this before?" the woman insisted. Mrs. Leonard, I've had all sorts of cases in ten years of service. Go home, your being here won't help in any way to find your spouse. Maybe you're here now, and he's waiting for you at home. That's happened, too. As soon as there's any news, I'll let you know right away," the investigator assured her. Jill knew there was no point in counting on the police alone. She posted a missing persons ad on her own and updated the information every two days. But no one wrote her anything. In order not to go crazy, she was swamped with work. Her state of health was terrible. She ate practically nothing. After a while, Jill realized she was pregnant. That must have been the last straw. Mom told Jill to pull herself together and not be sad. Pregnancy was no big deal right now. Jill, listen to me, John will come back, you'll have babies. Who forbids you? And if he doesn't come back, how will you manage with two kids by yourself? Look at you. What do you look like now? You look like a shadow. You're skinny, haggard. You even have circles under your eyes. When was the last time you ate? We'll help you, of course, but raising two kids alone is not as easy as you think. Right now you have to turn off your emotions and turn on your mind. In her mind, Jill knew that her mother was right, but something was bothering her. When she told her mother-in-law about the pregnancy, she broke into tears. Dash, God, Jill, what a joy. We will help you, you can count on us completely. We won't leave you for a minute. You understand, because if John does not come back, this child will be his continuation, she assured her woman. But her father-in-law did not share the position of his wife. He looked at Jill with a frown and muttered, Dash, do not listen to anyone, you decide. The decision must be yours alone. Everyone can give advice, but you have to live with it. Two children is difficult. If you decide to terminate this pregnancy, we won't judge you. Bruno, what are you talking about? His wife yelled at him. What? Look at her. There's only a shadow left of her. And the child has to be carried. That's selfishness talking right now. And if something happens to us, then how will Jill live? Or are you going to live forever? He turned to Jill, gave her a fatherly pat on the shoulder, and said, We'll take whatever decision you make. At home, Jill couldn't find her place. She couldn't get the words of her mother, mother-in-law, and father-in-law out of her head. Everything was jumbled up. She was confused. It was difficult. Eventually, the woman decided to listen to the majority opinion. Just as she was about to make an appointment for an abortion, the doorbell rang. When she opened it, Jill saw Matthew, John's brother, on the doorstep. Jill, hi. I was wondering what decision you made, the guy asked without entering the apartment. Matthew, is this any of your business? His notes of irritation were clearly audible in Jill's tired voice. Jill, I came to tell you that I'm willing to help you until John gets back. I make good money, and I'll give you part of my salary. 
For the sake of this baby. Jill, I beg of you. I can even live with you, if you agree to it, of course, he looked at her expectantly. Jill looked at him and could not believe what she was hearing. After a short pause, she almost whispered, Matthew, can you hear yourself? I'm your brother's wife, and I love him very much. I know. But you think too, if John were alive, he would have made himself known long ago. I'm sure he's not coming back. And life goes on. Don't say no at once. Think on my offer, the young man shrugged. I've already thought it over. No. You can come to your niece's. Forget about the rest, and she slammed the door in his face. That night she dreamed of John. He was alive and unharmed, smiling and holding out his arms to her. As she awoke, Jill made the final decision to give birth. From that moment on she felt better. But the pregnancy was going hard. Sometimes, the woman cried into her pillow at night and wished she had listened to her mother's time. Both families helped her. Matthew became a frequent visitor to their home. That didn't make Jill happy at all. The boy was three years her junior. She could only think of him as a younger brother, but in no way what he was trying to be to her. Matthew, well, I thought we talked about this. And I asked you not to come over so often. You can't replace my husband. This is a very bad idea. You're wasting your time. Make the most of it. Talk to girls your own age. You just realize that while I put up with you and talk to you nicely, things can change. The cute girl image suits you better. You understand, I love Emily, she's my niece. And you're no stranger to me. I'm just really worried about you, Matthew smiled. Jill looked at Matthew and realized how much she loved John. Despite his cheating, his attitude toward her, he gave her as much happiness as no man could give her. Now she would probably agree to any terms as long as her husband came back safe and sound. Time passed. Days after days, weeks after weeks dragged on tediously. No one knew anything about John. Though Jill was enviably persistent in going on the internet and sending out pictures of her husband, complete with cries for help. Matthew visited them with enviable persistence, bringing his niece toys and sweets. One day, while visiting John's parents, Jill noticed that her mother-in-law's tone had changed. It used to have a softness and tenderness about it, but now it was casual, sometimes even aloof. Mrs. Leonard, have I offended you in some way? You'd better tell me now, there's no need to keep it to yourself. Any misunderstandings we will solve, Jill inquired. The woman was silent for a long time. She seemed to be searching for the right words. Then she turned sharply to Jill and said quietly, almost in a whisper, You're too friendly with Matthew. He's young, he doesn't understand much because of his age. He thinks he's doing the right thing now, but he'll understand later. But it will be too late. He used to have such a nice girl, and when John disappeared, he left her and came to see you. If you had turned him down right away, he wouldn't have come. And if that's the way it is, it means you don't mind. You shouldn't. Your Matthew is very stubborn. He doesn't go to me, he goes to Emily. And I explain to him right away that I don't need him, that I love John, and there can't be anything between us. But he goes anyway. What he's hoping for, I don't understand. Do you want me to stop opening the door for him, sighed Jill heavily. I'm sorry. It's just that I'm worried about both my sons. My husband has gone completely bad, Jill hugged her mother-in-law. You know what I was thinking. Maybe we should hire a private detective. We'll add up the money if his services are too expensive. I think my mother wouldn't mind getting involved either. I'm tired of waiting for news from the police. They're not the ones with a missing father, husband and son. We need to start doing something ourselves. Do you agree with me, Jill tried to change the subject of the conversation. I'll talk to Bruno. Maybe you're right Jill. Why didn't this idea occur to us sooner, my mother-in-law agreed. The second half of the pregnancy went much easier, and Jill had a second wind in the process of finding her husband. She quickly found a private investigator. As the woman suspected, it was not cheap, 
but he was known as the best in town. The detective's name was Eugene. He was a serious, young, and very attentive man of about 35. He met with Jill for two days, and she brought him up to speed. He asked a lot of questions and all the conversations recorded on a tape recorder and then immediately began his search. Jill, on the other hand, was getting ready to give birth. She was only a couple of weeks away from her maternity leave. At the ultrasound, she was told she would have a son, and she decided to name him after her husband. It warmed her soul. She knew that John would be pleased when he returned. The woman had no doubts about the latter. It had been five months since John had gone missing, but Jill felt that he was alive. She often had the same dream of him standing there, smiling, and silently extending his arms to her. The woman thought it was a sign. As long as she had this dream, there was a connection between her and John. And that means he is alive. The parents on both sides of Jill were supportive. They, like the young woman, were looking forward to the birth of their grandson. They bought a crib and stroller, but Emily rarely asked about her father, so Jill put pictures of John around the house and at every opportunity reminded the girl of her father. The young woman made a promise to herself that until she saw John's body, she would wait for him. Even if it took her whole life. She would bear him a son and not let her daughter forget him. In the meantime, Eugene arrived at the science center to talk to Mr. Smart. He had arranged to meet him in advance. Hello, I was the one who called you, Eugene said as he entered Mr. Smart's office. Come in. Have a seat. What can I do for you, the master of the office invited him and pointed to the chair across from him. Mr. Smart, I'm well aware that it's been a long time since I've been here. And you may simply have forgotten some little things, but still try to remember in detail your last meeting with Mr. Leonard. Understand that every detail is important. His parents and wife and children are waiting for him. But I've already told the police everything. I don't understand what new things you want me to say, Mr. Smart threw up his hands. All right. Then just tell me everything again, the detective agreed. Such a detail as Mr. Smart's slight agitation did not escape Eugene. And why worry if your conscience is clear? Eugene looked at the man carefully, but he kept averting his gaze. Mr. Smart, my intuition tells me that you have not told me everything, and I want to believe that you did not do it with malice because you are involved in something, but simply forgot. Mr. Smart remained stubbornly silent, twisting the pencil nervously in his hands until he snapped it in half. And at that moment he flinched, as if he had woken up. I remembered, he said, glancing guiltily at the detective. Then he was silent again. Eugene didn't rush his interlocutor, giving him time to gather his thoughts, I asked John to walk my daughter home then. Why? She wasn't feeling well or it was too late. Is that relevant? Mr. Smart wondered. This is about a person's life, and every detail matters now, so what's important and what's not, let me decide. And understand that in our lives it's very easy to go from being a witness to being an accomplice. Are you threatening me, attempted Mr. Smart with indignation. Not at all. I'm just warning you, Eugene remained unfazed. So, I'm listening to you, the detective turned on the recorder. Eugene sat with enviable patience, waiting for Mr. Smart to start talking. Sometimes it seemed to him that he had forgotten all about him, but that was only at first glance. The man began to speak out of the blue, you see, there's a local authority, Jim Ketton, but everybody calls him Cat. He's been in jail. And my little girl was in the same company as him. He started stalking her. And that day I had to ask John to escort her because I saw Ketton trying to force my daughter into his car. John agreed to my little request. And they left. I never saw him again. And did you talk to your daughter? Did you ask her how they got home? What did they talk about? Mr. Smart nodded affirmatively, yes. She told me that they stopped at a cafe on the way and sat there for a while. He kept looking at his watch because he was in a hurry to get to the station. But in spite of that he walked her home. She never saw him again either. Is that all, clarified Eugene, seeing that the man was confused. 
Mr. Smart was silent again, apparently contemplating whether or not to speak further. Eugene waited patiently. Dash, I tried to get home early that day, Mr. Smart continued his confession. Smart continued his confession, the first thing I did was go up to my daughter's room. Nancy, we need to talk, I said. My little girl was lying facing the wall and didn't even move. I thought she was asleep. As I got closer, I noticed the earbuds in her ears. Nancy. I shouted louder. She turned off the music and turned to me and said, Why are you yelling? Can't you see I'm tired and want to sleep? You'll sleep when we talk. What happened to you? What have you got in common with that fellow? Nothing, her daughter muttered. So why is he treating you like he owns you? Tell me everything and we'll decide what we're going to do. I can help you. Well, Jim Ketton and I met at a party. We drank too much alcohol, well, then you know what happened. I don't understand, I replied then. Though, of course, I guessed it, but I guess deep down I didn't want to believe it. Dad, don't be silly. So, we slept with him. And then? Well, then what? I'm pregnant. What? I couldn't believe it at the time. You know, that news made my eyes go black for a while. My daughter and this criminal. I left her room in silence, went downstairs, and drank a glass of cognac. And when I felt better, I came back to hear the sequel, Does Ketten know about your situation? No, of course not. Dad, I wanted to charm John in the first place, but he was smarter than I thought. So you were flirting with John? You know, Eugene, I felt bad again then, when I realized that my girl was sleeping with almost everybody. I guess it was partly my fault. You know what she said to me? Daddy, John is so handsome. I couldn't resist that as a woman. So I thought I'd blame it on him, and then I'd deal with it myself. But he disappeared. So I asked what she was going to do. And she said she was going to have an abortion. I could not leave my little girl in a difficult situation for her, but I did not try to talk her out of an abortion. The next day we went to the clinic. The procedure was going hard. Time was lost. At night she opened bleeding. Nothing, her roommates woke up and called the doctor. She did not leave the hospital until a month later. She was pale, thin, scared. Then she told me she could never be a mother again. That's what the doctors told her. For me, of course, it was a blow. I held my little girl close to me, calmed her down as best I could. Although deep down I wanted to strangle her. It was all her own fault. Couldn't you be more careful? It's not the stone age we live in. But most of all, I blamed myself. How had I let her go? When? Why hadn't I taken an interest in her life? Work had always come first. Yes, I confess, I was sure that because I could provide for my daughter, that meant she was happy, but it turns out that wasn't enough. Can you imagine? I wish I'd realized it all now, when nothing could be fixed. Mr. Smart was silent for a while, and then he looked pityingly at the detective and said, almost in a whisper, You know, Eugene, I've never had a heart-to-heart -heart talk with my daughter in my life. I don't even know her life. She's dressed, shoes on, she's fed, she's got money on her card. And now I realize how scary it is. Eugene didn't know what to say to this poor man. He obviously didn't need his lectures. Eugene continued, I met with Ketten myself then, talked to him man to man, and strangely enough, he heard me the first time. Nancy slowly began to come to her senses. She resumed her studies at the institute. And then the police showed up with questions about where John had gone. I didn't want to involve my girl. I figured if I didn't say anything about John seeing her off, it wouldn't be a big deal, but I guess I'd have to go through it all over again. Where can I find Mr. Ketton, inquired Eugene. I don't know his home address. But I do know that he always walks near the nightclub. That's where I talked to him. Okay, Eugene stood up and turned off the recorder. He was about to leave, but suddenly stopped and turned around again, I almost forgot. 
please write me your home address. I want to talk to your neighbors. Maybe they can tell me something interesting. And also, how do I know Ketan? Do you happen to have a picture of him? That's the kind of thing I don't have. But, you know, you'll identify him right away. Oddly enough, the guy is good looking. He's tall, he's a jock, he's got tattoos, he's got an earring in his ear. In a word, you can't go wrong, grinned Mr. Smart. Eugene said, goodbye, and left the office when he received the address. When he returned to the hotel, he decided not to run immediately to find Ketan. It was necessary to make up his own opinion of him first. That he was a bandit was self-evident. Mr. Smart's attitude toward him was also clear. Ketan hurt his daughter and, therefore, he is bad. It cannot be otherwise. But how can Ketan and John be connected? And were they connected at all? That was worth finding out. First Eugene decided to pay a visit to Mr. Smart's home address and have a chat with the neighbors. Then he should talk to Nancy, too. She obviously knows more than her father. And I'll tell you this. Nancy's a real slut. One thing I don't understand is how such a decent father could grow up to be so, said the sweet grandmother who was sitting on the bench with the same friends outside the house where Mr. Smart lived. Smart. But she's very pretty, Eugene agreed. Nancy he had seen in a photo standing in Mr. Smart's office. Beauty alone isn't good for anyone. Brains must still be there. And what is this? She jumps into bed with one man and then another. And her father tries his best at work, a second neighbor joined in the discussion. Does she bring guys home or something, Eugene fake surprise as best he could. It happens that she goes home, too. She's Ketan's contact. He's the last person in town to have any contact at all. He's a real thug. Eugene saw that the grannies started the discussion with more and more enthusiasm. He decided not to interrupt them anymore and let them share their opinions. Really, here's the last guy she was courting, I liked him. He was very friendly. Always said hello, had good manners. He was handsome and a little older than Nancy. Oh, was he the one who got beaten up here afterwards, the second neighbor clarified. Everyone nodded in agreement. Eugene immediately took out his phone, opened John's photo, and showed the old ladies, was this man beaten? The old ladies looked closely at the smartphone screen and came to the conclusion that it was him. It's been a long time. It must have been six months, for sure. I saw everything through the window back then. He walked Nancy home. But only to the house, said the most talkative woman. And then? Then what did you see, hurried Eugene to them. And, in fact, who are you? Why are you the one asking, the grandmother suddenly asked, looking intently at the detective. This man is missing. And I'm trying to track him down. His wife is looking for him, the children are waiting. It's strange. The man's missing, but the police haven't come to see us. Well, here I am. You can tell me everything you saw that day. Eugene was beginning to lose patience, but didn't show it so as not to make himself even more suspicious. Do you have a detective's license? One of the friends asked with a knowing look. When the detective showed them the ID, they agreed to continue talking to him. Yeah, Ketan and his buddies were beating it. They waited until Nancy got into the house and the four of them jumped him. How could he do it alone? But you gotta hand it to him, he held on for a long time, he's a strong man. I shouted at them from the balcony to stop. But did they hear me in such a noisy environment? And then what happened? Well, then what happened? They put it in the trunk and took it away. And where, they didn't tell me, the grandmother shrugged. Walking up the stairs to Nancy's apartment, Eugene pondered how it was possible that the local police hadn't interviewed the neighbors. And immediately answered his own question, Mr. Smart had originally given the wrong information. Smart had initially given the wrong information. Had he concealed the fact then, maybe John would have been found long ago. 
When Nancy opened the door and Eugene introduced himself, she was not the least bit surprised. It was obvious that her father had already warned his daughter about everything. When asked what she remembered of her last day with John, the girl replied, He walked me home. We sat in a cafe on the way home, and then he left. I never saw him again. But you can't help but know that after you went into the house, he was met by Ketten and his cronies. They beat him up and took him away to an unknown destination. All the neighbors know, but you don't. The man is missing, and he's got a pregnant wife and a daughter, by the way. How should I know? I don't talk to my neighbors. And the windows and balcony face the opposite side, the girl replied indifferently. Nancy, why do you think Ketten and her cronies started beating up John? Only I beg you very much not to lie. I know more than you think. A man went missing five months ago. Nobody knows if he's alive or dead. And in this situation a witness could easily turn into a suspect, so let's not make an already complicated situation worse. The man warned her as soon as the girl opened her mouth. Nancy closed her mouth and looked silently somewhere past the detective. She could see that she was nervous. Then she got up and fetched a bottle of water and a glass. After taking a few sips, the woman jumped up and began pacing back and forth across the room. Nancy, calm down and sit down. You're making me dizzy. What could John have done or said that no one else saw him after the fight with Ketten? It's a long story, Nancy finally muttered, settling into her chair. Well, I think I have time to hear you out, and Eugene pulled a tape recorder out of his pocket. It all started with my friend's birthday. It was her anniversary, her 20th birthday. There must have been a lot of interesting people there. Including my ex, Lucas Ferguson. We dated for a while, we were even going to get married. But then I did something, I won't go into those details. Anyway, he stopped talking to me. And when I found out he was gonna be at this party, I decided to get him back no matter what. But I was wrong. He came with a girl and told everyone that she was his fiancée, I started drinking alcohol to forget my grief, and that's when Ketten came up to me and started paying attention. Nancy grimaced. It was obvious that she didn't like to think about it. She took another sip of water and continued, I don't know how he ended up there at all, in that company. But he asked me to dance and started kissing me right away. I didn't put up much of a fight. I wanted to show my ex that other men liked me. Then Ketten took me for a ride, and we went out of town somewhere. That's where it all happened. I hope you don't have to explain what happened, Nancy looked at Eugene with a smirk. You don't have to. I can guess, replied the detective. Well, that's fine. It should be noted that Ketten turned out to be quite an interesting young man. He had a lot to talk to me about. He started to pay attention to me, to meet me after the institute. But, how can I say it, I was shy of him. A lot of people have tattoos, but they're different. Ketep's prison left an imprint on him, you know? Eugene nodded. In short, that was enough for me for a month. And then I blew him off. By then I was already in a relationship with John, but getting rid of Ketten wasn't easy. Then I found out I was pregnant. What? Nancy asked, catching the detective's surprised and confused look. You're such a modern girl, and you didn't know about contraception? How could that be allowed to happen? She smirked and continued her story, well, that's the way it is. The decision formed in my head instantly. I decided to start an affair with John with the help of pregnancy. He's handsome and smart and has a promising future. He would be a very good father to the child. But there was one thing I hadn't considered. John, unlike me, knew perfectly well about contraception. And there was no chance of making him the father of the child. I didn't tell Ketten about the pregnancy. The criminal was not fit to be a father or a husband. And by the way, he was an excellent lover. Oh, Nancy, that's the side of your life I'm least interested in. Oh yes, I'm sorry, the girl laughed, while John was at the science center, he and I dated. Ketten saw this, of course, and he didn't like it, to put it mildly. 
To get him off my back, I told the girls on purpose that I was pregnant by John and we were getting married soon. I knew Ketten would find out the same day. And so it came out. Nancy, do you realize you set a man up? Ketten beat him up or killed him just because you allegedly got pregnant by another man. Was that not clear to you? Eugene wondered. I didn't think about it at the time. I had to get rid of that annoying lover, that's all. That's all. Just like that? How cheap, however, you value other people's lives, the detective resented. Oh, don't give me a moral. You don't know what I've been through, the girl exclaimed. What happened to you, Nancy, is the result of your behavior. But John. We don't even know if he's alive. And his wife and daughter are waiting for him, by the way. He's got a son on the way. But either way, there's nothing we can do about it. It's already happened. I'm sorry about John, though. But it's also true that he doesn't always act like an honest man. If he has a family, why was he with me? And you didn't know that, smirked Eugene. Nancy didn't answer right away, I knew. He told me all about it at the beginning of our acquaintance and made it clear that he wasn't leaving his family. There you go. That means it was already your desire to continue a relationship with a married man. He didn't rape you, did he? No, he didn't. And he even stopped seeing me lately. He said he confessed everything to his wife and wasn't going to break his word to her anymore. I thought my wife was beautiful there, and when I saw her, I laughed for a long time, Nancy smiled. So you think that a man who has a beautiful soul cannot be loved? Now I know you can. Nancy, answer me one more question. Do you think Ketten is capable of murder? I can't answer you definitively. But I can tell you for sure that he is vindictive and vindictive, the girl shrugged. All right. I'll ask one last question. If need be, are you prepared to testify in court and corroborate your testimony? She nodded affirmatively, and they parted. Eugene sat in the hotel all day, listening to the tape recorder over and over again. He simply didn't have the energy to show anger toward Nancy, but he understood from their conversation that this Ketten was not so simple. You have to be careful with him. Eugene decided to go to the nightclub tomorrow night and try to find Ketten. Well, today he needed to get his thoughts in order and get a good rest. The next day, at exactly 9 p.m., he was standing outside the nightclub. The detective identified Ketten immediately by his loud laughter and tall stature. He regarded him from the sidelines. The question begged itself. Could he really kill? The man entered the club, sat down at the bar, and ordered. Soon Ketten and his friends, in the company of the girls, entered noisily. They behaved, of course, disgustingly, loosely, defiantly, in a burrish way. After watching all this, the man, having finished his cocktail, left the bar with the firm intention of going to the police tomorrow morning and help them investigate. At the police station, the first thing Eugene did was to find out who was in charge of Mr. Leonard's case, and went up to his office. Mr. Brooks, good morning. My name is Eugene Fix. I'm a private investigator and I'm investigating Mr. Leonard. May I ask what stage the investigation is at? We will be closing the case. There is no evidence. Everyone weakened has been questioned, but it hasn't become any clearer, as they say. The man seems to have vanished into thin air. Let me help you. I have some useful information for you, Eugene smiled. For two hours he told the investigator about his conversations with Mr. Smart, Nancy, and the neighbors on the bench. He let me listen to the dictaphone recordings. You see, there are witnesses who saw how Ketten and his cronies beat Mr. Leonard, how they stuffed him in the trunk. We have to arrest the bastard and his whole crew. They should be interrogated. He won't tell me anything. But you, as an investigator, have a lot more authority, Eugene concluded. All right, tomorrow we'll start work on finding him, he agreed. What's there to look for him? He sits outside the club every day. We can go there tonight and arrest him right away, Eugene wondered. 
but in the evening Ketan was not at the club. Nor was he there the next day. The police were on duty at the nightclub all week and it was no use. Then they decided to change tactics and start watching Ketan's house as well. They learned from neighbors that he had a garage nearby, where the guys also gathered periodically. Only six days later, Ketan was arrested with the rest of the group. He had clearly been warned that they were looking for him because he was armed. During the arrest, Ketan shot back, hiding behind the backs of his friends, but he could not get away. He did, however, manage to wound one of the police officers in the arm, further complicating his situation. Eugene was very nervous before the interrogation. He was afraid to hear that John had been dead for a long time. At the interrogation, the boy acted defiantly, certain that the police had nothing on him. He sat sprawled out in his chair, with his leg over his head, and was in high spirits. Well, gentlemen of the police, shall we begin the interrogation? The guy grinned. Why did you and your stupid friends beat up Mr. Leonard? Who is this Leonard of yours? Ketton tried to feign incomprehension. All right, Mr. Ketton, I'm going to lock you in a jail cell and keep you there until you ask for questioning yourself. You're not a stupid man, you might even say experienced, you know how they meet you there. So, shall we talk? The interrogator was beginning to lose patience. All right, all right. Anyway, he and my girlfriend were together. That's why he got hit in the head, the guy agreed. But as far as I know, she wasn't your girlfriend anymore at the time of the fight, Ketan couldn't hide the surprise in his gaze. And Eugene rejoiced, there you go, freak, realizing that we're not so simple either, and we know something, flashed through his mind. But as soon as Ketan started talking, the detective realized he was lying. The guy claimed that John had been unconscious at the beginning of the fight and had been beaten up by his friends, and that Ketan himself had just been lying unconscious the whole time. You make me sad, Mr. Ketan. Half the house was watching your fight from the windows. If you don't start telling me the truth right now, I'm going to confront you. And, as you understand, it will have a direct effect on your prison term," sighed Mr. Brooks wearily. Brooks sighed wearily. The boy's gaze dimmed momentarily and became less brash and self-righteous. He got what he deserved. Don't go running after other girls when your wife's waiting for you at home. And you're the protector of the weak and oppressed? Acting like you're Robin Hood. What did you do after you threw the man in the trunk, said the investigator. Eugene discreetly turned on the tape recorder in his pocket. The guy continued to tell the story, we took him to the next town. There, on an abandoned beach, we dumped him with branches. Why there, clarified Mr. Brooks. The boys thought it was safer that way. They wouldn't find the body right away, and if they did, they wouldn't think anything of us. Well, judging by how much time had passed since then, they weren't wrong. Was he alive at the time? Eugene tensed, waiting for an answer. I don't know. Well, really, I don't know. We didn't check. We threw him out and drove away. We didn't care if he lived or died. What would that have changed, the guy replied. Where did so much cruelty come from, Mr. Ketton, the investigator marveled. But that question went unanswered. The guy only shrugged his shoulders. Soon he was taken away. After Ketton left, the picture began to become more or less clear. We have to go to the next town. Let's go tomorrow. And go straight to the police there. If they found him, we'll know all the details at once, blurted out Eugene. In the morning they drove to a neighboring city. Eugene learned the location of the abandoned beach, while Mr. Brooks went to the police station to find out more. As it became known, a man had indeed been found there some time ago. But his name is Joe. They found the investigator who handled the case. He identified himself as Lucas Burton and told them that he had personally taken the man to the hospital. How he ended up on the beach, no one knew. The man described how he had been found and his condition. Mr. Mr. Burton went to see him as if he were a second job. But he wasn't able to talk to the man until three months later. That's how long the victim lay unconscious. And who found him, asked Eugene. The boys found him. 
or rather, their doggy found him. The kids were fishing and the animal was wandering on the beach and so it smelled the man. They didn't find any ID on him. He could not remember anything either. He doesn't even know his name. Where is he now, inquired Eugene. We turned him over to the Territorial Hospital Department. Here's the address, and the policeman pulled out a business card with a phone number and address. They were there 20 minutes later. A police officer named Alexander was in the building with John. He told me that the man had moved into the apartment of the doctor who treated him after he was discharged from the hospital. I visit him and keep track of his life. The doctor calls him Joe because he never remembered his name and you have to address him somehow. Is that him? asked Eugene, showing a picture of John. Alexander studied the picture of the young and handsome man for a long time and then sighed sadly and nodded. Yes, something of that handsome man still remains. But not much. He grew a beard, which, by the way, makes him look very old. And, you see, he's got a lost look in his eyes. Like a man with no past. That must be awful. God forbid I should live through that. If you want, we can go see him. It's not far. No. First we'd like to talk to the very doctor who took him in. Do you have her coordinates? Mr. Brooks. The investigator gave them the phone number and said the woman's name was Clarissa Gareth. She was a neurologist at the hospital where John had been seen for a long time. After calling and clarifying the topic of conversation, they arranged to meet her at the hospital park. Clarissa was a pretty, slightly overweight woman in her 30s. Tell us everything from the moment Joe, aka John, came to his senses, Mr. Brooks. And Eugene, out of habit, turned on the recorder. Well, he was unconscious for three months. When he woke up, he immediately asked if he had been with us long. I told him everything then. But when I asked him what his name was, he just opened his mouth, but he couldn't say anything. He couldn't remember anything at all. Every day I went to him and asked him the same questions, hoping at least some of the memories would come back to me. But to no avail. In most cases his memory recovers on its own, that is, the amnesia passes by itself, without treatment. I reassured him, but it was hard to accept this fact Joe, because not to remember, it means to lose the past, at the risk of losing the future. When such a misfortune falls on your head, it's a disaster that turns your life into a nightmare. Who are you? What is your name? Do you have a family, children? What happened? Why are you here alone? Questions that won't be answered anytime soon. He once said to me. Dash, maybe I don't need to remember anything. Maybe I killed someone. You don't just beat a man up and leave him in the bushes to die. It was hard to watch all this. After a month and a half his health returned to normal, but his memory never did. And there were feelings between us. He liked me, and I liked him. I saw it when the head of the department raised the question of his discharge. I understood that he had nowhere to go and offered to move in with me. He had no choice then, and he agreed. You lived as husband and wife, he inquired Eugene. The woman nodded. We both knew deep down that it wasn't right. But no one was looking for him, and we had to live here and now. One morning I called him Joe. He was surprised at first, and then he decided it would be easier for both of us. Why didn't you go to the police with him? asked Mr. Brooks. I don't know. It would be more accurate to say I didn't want to do it. I decided right away that if he wanted to look for his family, I wouldn't stand in the way. But I wouldn't help either. You see, I really liked him. He was intelligent, smart, you could see that he wasn't just a worker. Yes, it's forbidden love, but it's no less sweet. One day I came home and heard Joe talking to a policeman, help me, I don't know how I got here. Why am I here? I don't know who I am or where my relatives are, if I have any at all. What do I do, said Joe. You don't even remember your name. Unfortunately, no. The doctor I live with temporarily calls me Joe. Why Joe? Well, because I don't care. 
I don't know my real name, and I have to be addressed somehow. Okay, we'll send out an orientation. You'll live here for now. Then I'll check in with you if there's any news. Thank you, I look forward to it. When I walked in, the policeman was on his way out. The relationship between us after this conversation became somewhat strained. He started sleeping separately, and then he found a part-time job. One day he was sitting on the bench and heard a neighbor scolding her son for bad grades. They got to talking, and Joe offered to tutor the boy in math and computer science and physics. He couldn't remember why, but he knew these subjects very well. The boy's parents agreed and paid Joe well for his services. That's when he made the decision to live on his own. Now he and I are just friends. We sometimes go to the movies, to a restaurant, go out, but not much else, Clarissa finished her story and went back to work. The investigator and the detective called Alexander and agreed to go to Joe's house together. The men drove up to a 10-story building and saw him sitting on a bench outside the house, talking to a boy about 12. They immediately realized that this was the same kid that John had been studying with. Alexander asked them to sit there and watch from a distance, otherwise the man might just be frightened by the pressure. Alexander went over to John, sat there, talked about something for about 20 minutes, and then went back to the investigator and the detective. He never remembered anything, Alexander said. Should we do something? Can the spouse be told that the husband has been found? She's waiting, Eugene clarified. I think so. If she's around, I think he's more likely to remember everything, Alexander nodded. On the way home, Eugene pondered how to present all the information to Mrs. Leonard. Of course, the most important thing in this story was that John was alive and well. And the memory. The memory will come back, you just have to wait. He recognized the young mother from a distance. She was holding a blue bag, and when she saw the detective, she was ready to rush toward him, but, remembering her son, she carefully put him in the stroller. The woman looked intently straight into the man's eyes, not asking anything. We found him. He's alive and almost healthy. What do you mean, almost healthy, the woman clarified. Eugene noticed that she squeezed the handle of the stroller so hard that her knuckles turned white. Calm down, Jill. That means he doesn't remember anything at all. When he got out of the hospital, John started life with a clean slate, and his name is Joe now. He is a man without a past. The doctor says his memory may come back, but when, no one knows, he threw up his hands. Why was he in the hospital? He was beaten, taken to a neighboring town, and dumped there. John was found completely by accident. That's basically all I wanted to tell you at this point. Now, Jill, the decision is yours. When you think of going after him, call me, Eugene left, and she remained standing. The son in the stroller had long been awake and crying, but the woman heard absolutely nothing. A passerby brought her back to reality, can't you hear your baby crying? Are you all right, woman? She tapped her lightly on the shoulder. It was as if Jill had awakened from a dream. She thanked the woman incongruously and began rocking the stroller, soothing her son. In the evening, after thinking it over, Jill decided to go to John with her son and leave Emily with her mother-in-law. She decided to take her mother with her, too. She also collected all his documents, diplomas, certificates. After calling her mother, she told her everything, and after securing her consent, Jill dialed Eugene. I'm ready to leave tomorrow, the woman said. Great, I'll pick you up at 8 o'clock sharp, he said. Eugene never dared to tell her about Clarissa, thinking it unnecessary. They were separated now, so why upset the woman, she'd been through enough. Why Joe, asked Jill on the way out. Jill, the man lives without a name, without a past, he had to be addressed somehow, so the hospital suggested calling him by that name. He agreed. I'm afraid he won't recognize me. Have faith in the best. Of course, no one can give you a guarantee, but you have to have faith, Jill, Eugene tried to cheer her up, by the way, don't be frightened. He's grown a beard, so he looks a little different, a little older. 
You will recognize him, of course, but it would be wonderful if he recognized you, too. Eugene noticed that Jill's hands were shaking. When they drove up to the right house, she refused to come out for a long time. I won't go, I'll wait for him here, she said in a trembling voice. While the detective and her mother were trying to persuade her, John came out of the house. Everyone was immediately silent and looked in his direction. Jill covered her mouth with her hand and whispered, My goodness, how thin and old he is. Jill, he's been through a lot. I understand, she nodded. The woman pulled herself together and got out of the car. She walked briskly toward her husband. Good afternoon, she said, smiling. Good afternoon, the man replied, without even looking at her. Could you help me? I've decided to rent an apartment in this neighborhood. Can you tell me about the neighborhood? Is it quiet? Do you like it? How long have you lived here? Relatively recently. I don't remember much, so I don't think I can be of much help to you," John answered and looked at Jill. And why are you looking at me like that? Do you think we've met somewhere?" the woman smiled. I don't know, but you're very pretty," he smiled. How about being friends?" suggested Jill, not expecting this from herself. He looked at her again. Don't get me wrong. It's just that I don't know anyone here either. And you and I could be friends while I'm living here. Well, that's fine with me," John replied dryly. Jill wanted to say something else, but at that time a woman came out of the house, walked up to John and kissed him on the cheek. How are you? Don't you remember anything?" she asked. He shook his head negatively. All right, let's go back to my place and have tea, she took him by the arm like a hostess and led him into the house. Immediately tears came out of Jill's eyes. She got back in the car and let her emotions run away. Jill, calm down. You're a grown woman, you must realize that he couldn't remember you so quickly, the detective tried to bring her to her senses. Is he cheating on me? She said hysterically. It was his doctor who treated him for three months. And then when he was discharged, she took him to her place. He had nowhere to go home to. He didn't even know his name. Jill, you have to understand that it wasn't John who lived in the apartment with her, it was Joe. They are two different people. Until you understand that, you won't get anywhere. So how does he live separately now? Where does he get his money from? If he's undocumented, he can't work. He got a job as a tutor for a rich family. He tutors the boy. They pay him well, and he was able to afford to rent his own place. She looked at Eugene with eyes red with tears, and he realized that the woman was very tired, especially mentally. Shall we go to a hotel, he suggested, and Jill agreed. The next day she decided to talk to the doctor, Clarissa Gareth. After knocking on an office labeled a neurologist, and hearing permission to enter, she opened the door. Clarissa looked intently at the visitor for a few seconds and then said, Hello, I saw you outside my house yesterday. You were talking to Joe. Jill nodded and sat down in her chair. That's right, Mrs. Gareth. Only he's not Joe, he's John Leonard, my husband. I'm Jill Leonard, the woman pulled out their pictures and John's papers together, I came to you for advice, what should I do? He doesn't remember me, but I don't want to take him home by force either. She noticed that the doctor was worried, but she even looked at the photo. Beautiful couple. And John is just handsome, she said. After a little silence, the doctor returned the photo to the owner and said, show him everything you've shown me and tell him little by little. You understand, Mrs. Leonard, Joe, I'm sorry, John has lived here long enough. He doesn't remember the past, so he's holding on to the present. That's all he has for now. The most important thing now is patience. I'm going to start saying your name more often, too. Maybe by working together we can get things moving. Thank you. One more question. Do you think I should go to his house? asked Jill. He might not let you in. Your husband is overprotective. And as you understand, you're a stranger to him. No offense, but he is. But on the other hand, Joe won't let you in the apartment. 
but if he remembered the name John, that would be fine. After thanking the doctor, Jill left the hospital and made her way to John's apartment. She couldn't find him at the house, so she decided to go up to the apartment. Ringing the doorbell, she heard a painfully familiar voice. Who's there? Jill answered. It's me, your new acquaintance, my name is Jill, we met yesterday. Remember me? Jill, he opened the door. Your name sounds familiar to me. I'm sure we've met somewhere. Maybe, maybe, the woman smiled as she stepped inside. The apartment John lived in was small. The order and cleanliness surprised him. He had been neat before, but he had never mopped the floor or cleaned it himself. It's cozy and very clean. Does someone help you clean? No. I do it myself. That's not bad. You're good. They drank tea and Jill talked about herself and showed John pictures. That's me and my husband, and that's our kids, daughter Emily and son John. The son looks a lot like her husband, don't you think? The man took the picture in his hands and looked at himself for a long time, but then just put it aside. How old is the daughter, he asked. Six. She's going to school next year. Unfortunately, she's very turned. She remembers her daddy a lot. I remember when she was five years old, I often had to leave her home alone. My husband kept explaining to her that she shouldn't open the door to anyone. And once he even made up a poem about it. Jill, looking her husband in the eye, began to recite a simple poem that only their family knew. John looked at her with his eyes wide open and suddenly continued in her place. That's right. How do you know, Jill smiled and clapped her hands. I don't remember. Maybe I heard it somewhere, John shrugged. The woman decided to drop the subject and began to talk about her parents. Showing him a picture of them, she said, Those are my husband's parents. They are wonderful people. They help me so much. He stared at the picture for a long time and then he said, Jill, I'm sorry, but I'm tired. Quickly removing everything from the table, she left. But she purposely left all of his documents, diplomas, and photographs on the table. All night long the woman lay awake, imagining that tomorrow he would open the door and say, Jill, I remembered everything. She did not fall asleep until morning. The next day she could not see her husband because John, her son, was ill and had a high fever. Jill concluded that it was for the best, because her husband would have time to think. And she would have time to gather her thoughts and accept the situation. After five days in this city, she was already used to being at John's house every day at 9 a.m. and talking with him while he waited for his student. Jill was already ready to stay in this city so that her husband would get used to her and quickly remember everything. One day she arrived at his house at 9 a.m., as usual. He was already waiting for her. In her hands she noticed the very bag of papers she had recently forgotten from him. John smiled and walked toward her. John, Jill's heart raced. Jill, here, take these, you forgot them on my desk, he said. A miracle didn't happen, flashed through her mind, and she cried. Why are you crying, the man wondered. Just missing my husband. I need him and so do the children. We're all waiting for him. Do you understand me, she sobbed. Don't worry, Jill, everything will work out. You just have to wait and believe, John reassured her. Sadness was instantly replaced by anger. Jill was angry at the fate that had treated them so cruelly. She was angry at her husband, who did not see the obvious things. Because of this, all her efforts were in vain. She was angry at her mother, who made her nervous every day, insisting that Jill finally tell him everything as it was, and that they all come home together. The woman's hands were dropping. She had come to a strange city for a man who didn't remember her at all. She had no idea how long it would take for the memories to return and for their family to rebuild. And would that time ever come? Suddenly she calmed down and looked intently at John. We need to have a serious talk, can we come to you? He nodded. They went into the apartment. 
He sat down on the couch and Jill took a chair and placed it across from her spouse so she could look him in the eye and watch his reaction, as they talked. Your name is not Joe. You are John Leonard. I'm your wife Jill Leonard. Those pictures are of our children, Emily and John. In that bag are all the diplomas and certificates and documents. These are all yours. I know, John said suddenly. Jill even flinched in surprise. The flame of hope flickered in her soul again. Do you remember everything, she whispered. No. It's just that the first time you showed me that picture, I realized that the man in the pictures looks a lot like me. Accordingly, it was either me or my brother. I'm not an idiot. Then when you started to tell me that your husband was missing, I guessed that it was me. I just didn't let it show. When you left and left the papers on the desk, I went over them a few times, hoping to remember something, some little thing, but to no avail. What happened to me? Six months ago you went on a business trip to the science center and went missing. We've been looking for you all this time, and then I hired a private investigator, and he was able to find you here. She was quiet for a moment, then moved closer, took his palms in hers, and whispered. John, let's go home, your parents and brother are waiting for you there. We all need you. We're not happy without you. The man released his hands, stood up, and said, I have to think. She rose silently and headed for the exit. You think about it. But just know, I'm not leaving here without you, said the woman, standing at the front door. She walked out. On the way back to the hotel, she dialed Eugene's number and told him everything that had happened. He answered. Need a stressful situation. I'll be there soon. Jill was glad he was coming. She knew the detective would help. Eugene drove out that evening. He was worried about this family, not knowing why himself. Upon his arrival, Jill told him everything in detail. Eugene could see how nervous she was. You see, Eugene, he didn't accept the information I told him. I don't think he's going to go home with me. I certainly knew it would be difficult, but I didn't think it would be this difficult. Don't worry, Jill, you and I have to think through the whole situation that would trigger him emotionally and get him out of the quagmire he's been living in for almost a year. And it's strange that he doesn't want to get out of that swamp. He's just more relaxed that way. But I won't give up. He's the man of my life. I'd do anything for him, even walk barefoot on glass. Well, I think that's unnecessary. Although, I must say, I envy your husband. It's a great blessing to have a wife like that. Don't exaggerate. I'm an ordinary wife who's just in love with her husband. That's what's surprising. After all these years of married life, he smiled. What do you propose to do, Jill shifted the topic of conversation. Listening more closely to the detective, the blood rushed to her face. All in all, it wasn't a bad idea. She'd have to remember the basics of acting. But for John she was willing to do anything, and even to learn a new role for herself. Thank you. I'll do anything. Let's try that, too, Jill said, when Eugene stopped talking. At this they said goodbye, and went to their rooms to rest, to gain strength and tomorrow to play the premiere of a play for a very important man. There was a woman in love in the leading role, which meant that everything was going to work out just fine. The next day, in the afternoon, Jill went to John. They had tea and cake. He asked her about the past, and she gladly told him. When it got dark she started for home. John volunteered to walk her home. Thanks, I'm not far, just a short walk to the bus stop, she thanked him. As they left the house, Jill began to shake a little. The main part of the play was beginning. She knew Eugene was waiting around the corner of the house next door. When they reached the right corner, the woman said to John, Go back home, I'll make it on my own. It's drizzling, God forbid you catch cold. He wanted to argue something, but she insisted and, after kissing him on the cheek, goodbye, disappeared around the corner. As she approached the house, the man heard a heartbreaking cry. Help. Jill. Rushed through his mind. 
The man quickly ran to where the call for help came from. He saw Jill struggling with some thug who was desperately trying to snatch the woman's bag. When he saw John, he punched Jill and ran away, getting slapped in the face. She lost her balance not so much from the force of the blow, but from the surprise. This was not what she and Eugene had agreed to. But, I must say, from the outside it looked very authentic. Jill, are you all right, a frightened John ran up. He helped her up and saw large tears streaming from her eyes. The resentment was choking the woman so that she could not utter a word and only nodded. John shook off her cloak of leaves, sat her down on the bench, and took out his cell phone. We should call an ambulance, he said, while Jill tried to let him know that he didn't need anything. The man was already on the phone. My wife was attacked and beaten. Yeah, she's conscious. She can talk, he answered patiently and glanced nervously at Jill, what? What kind of injuries? John covered the tube with his palm and turned to Jill, what are you in pain? She shook her head negatively. I'm sorry, John answered into the phone and turned off his cell phone, how's your back? Does it hurt, he inquired. She nodded. Well, there you go. And you say you don't have any pain. But you know about my back, the woman muttered, still continuing to cry. Yes, I do. Autumn is the hardest time for her, the man sighed. That's just it. The bag was stolen. Pathetic, sobbed Jill. Nonsense. She was old. It's years old. I'll buy you a new one, John waved his hand. He put his arm around his wife. That's when it hit Jill. He remembered her back and the bag. She wanted to say something, but remained silent for fear of spooking her luck. I have to go. My mother and son are waiting for me at the hotel, she said quietly. Let me call you a cab, John said, then looked at Jill, smiled and pointed to his beard, before I show up in front of my relatives, I need to get cleaned up. The woman rode in the cab and was afraid to get excited. She didn't understand how successful their performance was, what exactly he remembered, all or just the episodes. All would not be known until tomorrow. Then Jill noticed that Eugene's car was following her. They had already entered the hotel together. I'd like to point out that there was no real agreement to fight, Jill said slightly offended. I agree. But who knew you would fight so desperately for your junk? I mean, you had your hands full in it, so I had to act on the situation. And that, mind you, was the only thing I could think of. If your husband had run up to me, I would have had to fight him. And that scene would have been much more interesting and more traumatic. Don't you think so? Eugene nodded. Jill couldn't agree more, Jill, really, it was spectacular, he laughed. Thank you, Eugene, for your help, she laughed back, by the way, he remembered that I was his wife. About my bad back he also remembered, and also that my bag is already old. You understand, we've moved things along. So that's great news. But let's not jump to any premature conclusions and wait until tomorrow, the man exclaimed. Upon entering the hotel room, Jill realized her mother was still awake. She was waiting for details. The woman could not sleep all night. After these events they would learn to appreciate life, which is more important than anything in the world. At such moments you realize how fragile and unpredictable the world around you is. At such moments, you realize how important every minute, every second, every moment spent with your loved one is. How she wants to talk to him, to be in his arms, and breathe life into him. Sleep did not come to her until morning. When she came down to breakfast, she saw Eugene. In his hands he held her bag. What will you do with it? You can't let John see it, the man asked. I agree. We should just throw her out. It really is very old. Especially since her husband promised a new one, Jill nodded. Even so, smiled Eugene, feigning surprise. Jill laughed, and after a little silence, she suddenly asked, Eugene, can I ask you a personal question? Sure, he nodded, taking a sip of coffee. Why aren't you married? 
He looked at her very carefully, and the woman caught the tenderness in that look. The thought suddenly flashed through her mind, what would happen if she didn't have John in her life? They might well have been a couple. I guess I haven't met the one, loyal and in love with my husband yet, the man replied, averting his gaze. Eugene, you are a wonderful man. I think you are bound to meet such a woman. After breakfast, they went to John's this time, with her mother. Jill was nervous. She didn't know if he would recognize her mother or not. When the man opened the door, she gasped in surprise. Standing in front of them was the familiar John. He had shaved off his beard and looked ten years younger at once. Before her stood the same John she had once known. Hello, Jill, he smiled. Do you remember mom, asked Jill. Sheila Gordon, the man blurted out after thinking for a while. That's right, that's right. John, congratulations on your return. And this is your son, Jill said and handed him the baby. He took him in his arms and looked at his wife in confusion, here's a son I certainly don't know. And that's not surprising. I found out I was pregnant after you disappeared. What's his name? Sam, Jill replied, and caught her husband's satisfied look. Jill wanted to leave as soon as they went to the police, but John didn't want to do that. He needed to say, goodbye, to the student and his parents. These people had saved him by giving him a job. He needed to say, goodbye, to Clarissa, for she, too, had played no small part in his story. She had sheltered him, fed him. All these people had been his guardian angels for quite a long time, and he just had to say thank you to them. The student cried for a long time, unable to imagine how he would study without John's help. The tests were coming up, and the kid was worried. His parents were upset, too, because their son was doing much better, and no one wanted to go back to the old days. They agreed to study online and transfer the payment to the bank card. This option suited absolutely everyone. John went to say, goodbye, to Clarissa at the hospital. Going home to her house was somehow uncomfortable now. I'm leaving, Clarissa. I came to say thank you for everything. You really helped me out, kept me from disappearing and turning into a bum. And I'm sorry I couldn't give you what you deserve. We didn't have a future to begin with. I'm sorry, you'll meet your soulmate. I'm sure you will. It couldn't be otherwise. If you and I ever meet, we'll look at each other with a light heart, and we'll remember our adventures with a smile. But we will never regret what happened to us. Never, the woman replied. She got up from the table, walked over to him in a hug, and whispered in his ear, thank you for brightening my loneliness. We would have made a good couple, if you had loved me. But we didn't, the doctor said. Then she returned to her workplace and in a completely different tone said, you should definitely register with a neurologist and see a psychologist. Why do I need a psychologist, the man was surprised. You do not understand. When you come into the collective, you're going to have a hard time. You have to adapt to society. Just don't hide, don't close yourself off from the world, thinking there are enemies around. Promise me that you will do as I ask you. All right, I promise you. He walked quickly out of the office. For some reason it was very hard on the soul. Anxiety and completely unwarranted fear was building up. He was leaving his little world in which he had lived for a year. And that life was not bad at all. But he had to move on. Life does not stand still. With Jill and Eugene they went to the police. John told them everything from the moment he left on his business trip. Then Eugene brought them home to their hometown. Their parents cried, hugged, and inundated them with questions, but John really wanted to take a shower and get some rest. Emily looked at her father like he was a ghost. We had to wait for her to get used to him. A year is a long time for a child of that age. Not much time passed. One day Jill arrived at her mother's house, and the woman noticed her daughter's mood from the threshold. Jill, is everything all right, she inquired. She shook her head, I don't know, I always thought he'd come back and we'd all be living like we used to. But it will never be like before, because John is different. 
Where can I find so much strength to fully accept the situation and realize a simple truth? There is no going back. We are starting a new relationship, we are getting to know each other all over again. We've both changed a lot in a year. Now the question is, will we like each other so renewed? I have become tougher, more independent and used to make my own decisions. John has fallen in love with me in a different way. Will he accept all these changes in me? Does he understand that fate has given him a chance to return to his family, to his familiar way of life? Only is that way of life still familiar to him? God, why so many questions? Mom, it's so complicated. My brain is ready to explode. Honestly, I didn't think it would be this hard. Do you still love him? The mother asked quietly, hugging her daughter close to her. Yes, my feelings for him remain. And besides him, I don't want to see anyone else around. He is a wonderful man. He's my favorite genius, the girl nodded. John was hired as an ordinary employee. His former position was long gone. And production had undergone many changes in a year. Progress was never static. John had to learn a lot of information all over again, to rejoin the team, where he was looked upon as an oddball. Not every nervous system can withstand that kind of stress. And his system gave up. He went to work without pleasure. He did not communicate with his colleagues. His wife tried to talk to him, but that annoyed him even more. If it's not your thing, why work there, aren't there enough jobs, she kept saying to Jill. Everything here isn't mine. Everything, you know? Other people's work, people's town, John muttered. Maybe we're strangers to you, too, Jill's eyes instantly filled with tears, you know, I already feel guilty about finding you. Don't talk nonsense. You did everything right. It just takes time, John hugged his spouse, Clarissa advised me to see a psychologist. I didn't understand why then, but now I do. I just need it. Working with a psychologist really helped a lot. She was a middle-aged woman with a lot of experience. You don't have to worry. There are a lot of people with problems like yours all over the country. But unfortunately not everyone is that lucky. Many have been living under false names for years, she said. I was Joe once too, smiled John. You got the name Joe a year ago and have had time to get used to it. It's understandable that even your real name you have to get used to all over again. But as a rule, after a year and a half, almost everyone integrates into society. Many people blame doctors and the police for their bad work. But there is nothing to blame them for. A hospital is not a shelter, a hotel, or a bed and breakfast for homeless people. They brought you back to life. Can you imagine a man who has to move from his room to the streets of a foreign city with no money, no papers, no name, no memory? Just the thought of it gives me the creeps. I was lucky, I had help from good people. I didn't end up on the street. They even gave me a name. It was only thanks to them that I was able to survive all this hell. But that's not what's bothering me right now. You see, everything annoys me, my wife, my children, my parents. I understand that they are not guilty of anything, but I can't do anything with myself," exclaimed John. You're annoyed at your wife for finding you and pulling you out of your usual environment, am I understanding you correctly? I'm ashamed to admit it, but you're right. You have to decide for yourself, John, do you want to be in the family or not? Do you need this woman as a wife or not? Once you decide these questions, believe me, you'll feel better right away. But it's not like I can leave my two kids and leave my family. And you think coming home with a sour face and thinking everyone is to blame for your troubles only makes them happy? I doubt that very much. The family needs to feel that you need them. All family members need to feel that only together can you overcome all difficulties. Otherwise, the family becomes a cage in which the instruments of torture will appear very soon. So day after day, month after month, the psychologist brought John back to life. Gradually he developed an interest in his work. He and Jill began to spend more time together. His relations with his parents became better. Once again everything was in bright colors. 
It took two years. For two long years he recovered from the horror he was able to endure thanks to his wife. John is still amazed at how much courage, fortitude, tenacity, and strength this little woman had. She had enough love and tenderness for everyone, and in return she needed the warmth and love of her loved ones. After another year, John was called to court. He didn't want to plunge into that nightmare, but he had nowhere to go. When Kenton was led into the courtroom in handcuffs, John shuddered. The handsome guy's facial features became animal-like, predatory, but not human in any way. The look was maddening. In a word, this guy had finally lost his human face. He responded in a burrish way. As usual he never cared what others thought of him. When he saw John, the guy smirked. So, you're still alive. Too bad, I should have hit you harder. Well, live on, but remember, you can't take someone else's stuff, he held up his index finger. The boy laughed so loudly that the judge reprimanded him. Mr. Smart also attended the trial. Smart, who first came up to John and apologized. Nancy, on the other hand, walked by and pretended not to know John. The man looked at her and did not understand what he liked about her. Kenton ended up getting 15 years in maximum security, while the accomplices were given a lesser sentence. As the defendants were being led out of the hall, Kenton yelled for Nancy to wait for him out of jail. That was the end of the nightmare, and John and Jill went home together. Emily pleased her parents with her progress in school. It was obvious that she inherited her brains from her father, because she was always ahead of her peers in her studies. But John's relationship with his son did not work out. The boy did not accept him and stubbornly called him uncle. On this ground they often quarreled with Jill. One day John arrived at his mother's house, and when he was alone with her, he asked, Mom, are you sure Jill hasn't been with anyone in my absence? What kind of a question is that, son? Your wife is a very decent woman and loves you madly. But John is your exact replica, too. I don't know. I don't get it. Mom, the kid doesn't recognize me. But that's only half the trouble. I, you know, have absolutely nothing for him, the man sighed. Well, that's why they don't admit it. Kids feel everything. And if you don't accept him, why should he accept you, the mother looked questioningly at John. To be sure of his wife's fidelity, the man did take a DNA test, but no one in the family ever found out about it. The result showed a 99.9% .9 match. After making sure, John burned all the papers. He felt better, but he still didn't have feelings for the child. But he couldn't look Jill in the eyes for a long time. The man was incredibly ashamed. Jill saw John's relationship with his son and it made her very sad. She didn't know how to change the situation. Sometimes she snapped when he brought up that life of his too often. Do you like to suffer and enjoy torturing me? Please, just notice, you feel sorry for yourself like it's all my fault. John, I understand this is hard for you, but can you stop feeling sorry for yourself and clinging to the past? That's not the answer. You've got a family, you've got children who take after their father. When a man is loved, he is accepted in every way, John muttered. Aren't you accepted? I just want you to stop looking back and move forward, but I see you want to go back. Don't push me. Give me time, he whispered. Jill didn't know that John was having problems not only with his family, but at work as well. I guess it all started when he presented his project he was preparing for his doctoral dissertation. It was a bold move several years ahead in the security field, but instead of praise and recognition, his superiors accused him of plagiarism. What are you talking about? I've got my own head on my shoulders pretty good, so I don't use other people's ideas," John snapped. I don't know what your goal is, but I know for a fact that your thoughts and Stephen Simon's thoughts are the same. He presented us with this idea a week and a half ago, the department head told him. You mean you don't believe me, he wouldn't budge on John. What do you mean, believe or disbelieve? Mr. Leonard, we're not in kindergarten. He came home very angry that day and yelled at Emily when she asked for help with math. He argued with his wife when she tried to calm him down and said he was going to spend the night at his parents' house. 
he slammed the door loudly and went to his mother's house, hoping to find understanding there. He walked to his parents' house to recuperate and put his thoughts together. After telling his mother and father everything that had happened to him at work, John looked at his frowning father and said, I should have listened to you then, dad, when you suggested I patent my project. But I had no idea it would be stolen. And now I could hardly prove anything. Can you imagine, in the eyes of my colleagues and the whole company I turned out to be a thief. Son, don't you worry, I, the father began, but John didn't let him finish. He burst out again, don't, dad, don't give me any comfort. So much work has been wasted. Do you understand? And it's all gone in an instant. Shut up, my father said menacingly. John was silent, and the mother flinched in surprise. They both looked at the head of the family. Let me finish. I patented your project. Yes, I did it in secret from you, but you got stubborn then and asked a lot of unnecessary stupid questions. I decided to do it myself. To be honest, I don't regret it. The father went to the closet, took out a folder of documents and handed it to his son who still could not believe what was happening and from surprise could not utter a word. Here. Here are all the documents. Take them to work and prove to everyone the truth. And go back to your wife and kids. And next time, I think you'll be a little smarter, said the father. John could not believe what was happening. The adrenaline in his blood was off the charts. He was laughing and crying at the same time. He hugged his father and mother. The only thing was that he didn't go back to his wife, he stayed the night at his parents' house. The next day John came to work a little earlier and went straight to the CEO's office. He did not look at him very friendly. Apparently, he had already been told that Mr. Leonard had stooped to stealing ideas. At the department meeting Stephen Simon sat looking like a winner. When everyone was assembled, John stood up and asked. I'd like to check with Mr. Simons again to see if he was sure he wrote his own project. What kind of questions, Mr. Leonard, are you still not calming down? The CEO wondered. Mr. Howard, when did Mr. Simons turn in his project to you? John turned to the head of the department. But I told you yesterday. It happened a week and a half ago. Then I ask you, Mr. Riley, to read these papers and then draw your own conclusions about the whole situation." John turned to the general manager and tossed the folder on the table with a winning look. Simons tensed up, and the head of the department began to blush with anger. An hour later Stephen Simons and his belongings left the workplace for good, and Mr. Howard publicly apologized to John. John's honorable name was restored. And it was all thanks to his father. But despite the resolution of the main problem, John was in no hurry to return home. He spent the second day at his parents' house, and Jill did not find herself at home. When she waited for her husband until late in the evening and decided to call him, Mrs. Leonard answered the phone. Yes, Jill, I'm listening. John is already asleep, and I saw that it was you calling, so I decided to answer. Did something happen? Well, aside from the fact that your son has been staying with you for the second day without an explanation, everything is fine. I wanted to see how he was doing. He's fine, dear, my mother-in-law answered sweetly, as if nothing had happened. Mrs. Leonard, don't you yourself wonder why he doesn't go home? Are you satisfied with everything? Doesn't he care if we're alive and well? Or do you think this behavior of a grown man is normal? Jill, I'm not used to interfering in my son's lives. I see. I take it he's taking a break from his family and you're not interfering with him. Good. But tell your son that I don't like uncertainty. If he wants to leave the family, I'm not stopping him. I'll support any decision he makes, but he has to voice it, Jill answered with a sigh. She did not wait for her mother-in-law to answer and hung up. Jill cried all night. The woman missed her husband. This silent confession to herself was annoying because she was drawn to him. She probably still loves him. After so many years of married life, separation is a resounding slap in the face, it is a terrible pain and hopelessness. They are standing at the very edge of a precipice. 
next should begin a new life for both of them, but what it will be, no one knows. When she heard the alarm clock, Jill could barely open her eyes. She knew she couldn't let herself get depressed. She had two children. She needed to wake up finally, to come to her senses, to understand and accept the fact that their family was in trouble again. She needed to put a smile on her face and go make the kids breakfast. Emily she sent to school. John she sent to kindergarten. She ran off to work herself. That day John went to his parents' house after work as usual, but he was in for a surprise. His mother opened the door, but would not let him in. Why are you here again? She asked. Well, how, confused John. Go home, John. Your wife and kids are waiting for you there. If you don't want to live there, then explain yourself to them and leave, as you should. But to do this is mean and low, and certainly not manly behavior, and the woman slammed the door right in front of her son's nose. John stood a little longer at the threshold, and then went home. He bought flowers and cake on the way, but as he entered the apartment, he realized he was not expected. No one came out to meet him. The apartment smelled delicious with dinner. He wandered through the rooms and found Jill in the nursery. She was helping her daughter do her homework, and her son was already asleep. His temperature was up. Hi. How's it going? John said softly. We need to talk, Jill replied in a cold tone. She kissed her daughter on the top of her head and went into the kitchen. There she put her spouse's dinner down, poured tea, and sat down across from Jill. Where have you been and why have you come? We weren't expecting you, she asked. Don't start, Jill. I was in trouble, John muttered, realizing that the evening was not going to be what he had imagined. And I'm not starting. I'm just trying to figure out, is my happiness really all about constantly waiting for my husband from work and then finding out he's decided to stay with his parents, and when he's home, I have to watch him sit through science literature. And us. When will our time together come? Is that really so much to ask? I just want to be able to be happy. You have that opportunity. Yes, but I don't think I have it with you anymore. Somehow I'm getting more and more used to the idea that a happy life with you is something fabulously unbelievable. You want a divorce? John looked intently at his spouse. Yes, I haven't found support and marital happiness in you. Then why do I want all this? She looked at her husband. There was no hatred in her eyes, only sadness and hopelessness. Jill, don't be silly, I need you. The problems at work are taken care of. Things will be different now, believe me. No, if you've already made up your mind, and you want to break up, I can pack up and leave, but answer me this, is that really what you want? There you go again, smirked Jill, again you want to put all the responsibility on me. Can't you make up your own mind about whether or not you want to live with us? I want to, he answered firmly. All right, Jill agreed, I agree to try again, but there will be no more second chances. In the meantime, a scandal was breaking out at her parents' house. Matthew, when he heard that his mother hadn't let his brother in, couldn't stand it. I knew it, he told his mother, I knew this is how it would end. She would have been happy with me. Her husband needs no one but science. Why torment a woman? Mrs. Leonard looked at her youngest son and shook her head. Take care of your own life, she said quietly, and they'll figure it out for themselves. I shouldn't have listened to you then, Matthew looked angrily at his mother, I should have insisted on my own. She would have given in anyway, and she would be happy with me now. He retired to his room, not wanting to talk any further, knowing that his mother did not support him. Mrs. Leonard stared out the window in silence for a while, and then she called to Jill. How are you doing, the woman inquired. So far so good, replied the daughter-in-law. What do you mean so far? You should always be doing well. John loves you, I know it. He told you that himself, smiled Jill. I've lived my life, girl, I don't need to be told that, I can see everything. Mrs. Leonard, do you think I'm against a quiet life? But something tells me that John won't last long. 
he does everything by force, as if he were forcing himself. I'd really like to be wrong, but I can see it all, and believe me, it's not the nicest thing in my life. Jill, you have two children, you have to think about them, my mother-in-law said dryly. They are the ones I am thinking of, but I would very much like to have both mother and father thinking of the children. They will, dear, said Mrs. Leonard, and then said good, bye, and hung up. Indeed, slowly life began to get better. John had been promoted to head of the department and given an office. His salary had also increased manifold, and they were able to take the whole family on a vacation to the sea. The spouse paid more attention to their son, and he became closer to him and began to call him daddy. John and Jill often gave the children to grandmothers and spent evenings together. Jill calmed down. She saw the love in her husband's eyes, still the same love she had in the days when they had met. But trouble had come from somewhere they weren't expecting. The ambitious Jessica came to John's department. She was a little older than him, joined the team with her development, which was close to the subject. The girl quickly became his deputy because she had an energetic nature and knew exactly what she wanted in this life. John became the same. He was no longer playing with children, and there were no more romantic dates with Jill. He spent all his evenings in his office discussing work moments with Jessica on the phone. He admired her and made no secret of it. John never tired of telling me how good Jessica was. How well she has established discipline in the department. How all the subordinates fear and tremble at the sight of this woman. And Jill listened and realized that just talking wouldn't end it. Her soul was breaking into splinters. Everything inside was burning so badly that her breath was even coming out. God. Why am I going through all this? And why does it hurt so much, she asked herself, why do I put up with all this? As my mother says, I am a beautiful, young woman, well-mannered, well-educated. Yes, maybe I'm not as ambitious, but I'm quite self-sufficient. Do you have to disrespect yourself so much to endure this kind of humiliation? Before, she could justify her tolerance with feelings. Now there were none. The heart that had once chosen this man had become icy. She didn't want to live, didn't want anything at all. At that moment, there was no one Jill hated more than her husband for his betrayal. There was no doubt in Jill's mind that her husband was cheating on her after she had been to a corporate New Year's Eve party. John led his deputy over to his wife, gently holding her hand and kissing her fingers. Jill's composure didn't let her down, the woman smiled sweetly and, giving her hand, said, My husband only talks about you, so it seems to me that we have known each other for a long time. That's exactly how I pictured you, too, the girl replied sweetly. And then, turning away and maybe forgetting, or maybe on purpose, she said, John, oh, excuse me, Mr. Leonard, everyone is invited to the table. Aren't you forgetting that you're congratulating the staff, and with a smile, she left. Jill felt as if a bucket of garbage had been poured on her head in public. She, citing a headache, decided to go home. Jill, why don't we have a glass of champagne to celebrate, her spouse coaxed her. No, she said quietly, you have fun, but it will be our last conversation at home, my patience has run out. What's with the fantasies again, the spouse burst out. I hate you, hissed Jill and headed for the exit. John did not come home that night or the next day. Warned that he would be staying with his parents. On New Year's Eve, Jill made up her mind definitively and irrevocably. God knows she wanted to keep the family together, but it didn't work out. Maybe it's even better, there is no need to be afraid of change, they always lead to another happier life. It was freezing outside the window. The branches of the trees swayed in the wind, and the fluffy snow that had managed to attack during the night fell from them. The playground was covered in snow, and so were the cars, abandoned by their owners in the yard, rushing to greet the new year. This was her second terrible New Year's Eve, the first had been when John disappeared, and the second was now. She woke up early in the morning. The children were still asleep, and the woman could be quietly sad without explaining anything to anyone. No matter how hard Jill tried to hold on, depression came over her. What a fool I am. So many years lost, and the man is gone and hasn't even looked back. 
It's only now to realize that John will never be enough of one woman. It's a pity I didn't come to this until after so much time. At lunchtime my parents came over to wish the Leonards a happy new year. Jill really didn't want to talk about her relationship with her husband, but how do you explain the fact that her spouse wasn't living with them for a second day? Jill, don't worry. Things will get better, her mother tried to reassure her. Mom, what's going to work out? What, the young woman knew she was raising her voice, but she couldn't help herself, her emotions were tearing out, I looked for him so much, then I adjusted to his condition, and in the end what? I ended up abandoned with two children. Well, let's say, but so far no one has abandoned you. Haven't they? What would you call it? He lives at his parents' house, talks to me on the phone, is only interested in Emily, and he doesn't need John again. He never became his own son, you know, mom? I think, Jill, you're winding yourself up, it's absurd. Yes, maybe he's more reserved with his son than he is with his daughter, but that doesn't mean he hasn't acknowledged him. Things will get better, the father said. The parents hugged their daughter, and she felt like a little girl again. They left toward evening. Jill put the children to bed and went into the bedroom. There she opened the closet, stood for a while, looking at the even stacks of John's clothes, at the iron shirts hanging neatly on the shoulders. Then the woman pulled out her suitcases and began stacking his things. I'm starting a new life, she told herself, having been disappointed in one man, you shouldn't assume that everyone is like that. You have to love yourself and bathe in a man's attention, not all this. It was snowing for the second 24 hours. The cold light fell into the room and made her feel wistful. Jill looked at the snowflakes that clung to the window. Then, caught by the wind, they flew on, decorating the ground, the trees, the rooftops. New Year's Eve was always a special holiday for her. It was a time of wonder and magic, but now sadness and emptiness took her captive, and they were not going to let her go anytime soon. She felt like an old woman with a faded look, utterly lost in the midst of life's difficulties. All these days Jill had not slept, she lay down, but could not fall asleep. In the morning she would get up broken and not at all rested. But most of all she wondered why Mrs. Leonard did not call her. And then she remembered that in light of recent events she had even forgotten to wish her a happy new year. She had already picked up the phone to call her mother-in-law, but she heard the doorbell ring. Mrs. Leonard herself standing on the threshold. Why can't I get John on the phone, she asked in a commanding tone, and without undressing she walked into the room, get him for me. Jill looked at her with an incomprehensible look. Happy New Year to you, too. Hasn't he been staying with you all this time? What time? If he was living with us, do you think I'd be looking for him here? So he's living with his mistress, Jill smiled. Jill, you know what I don't really like about you? It's your tendency to get worked up about the situation. What do you mean? John has had a mistress for a long time, he hasn't hid that fact much, her name is Jessica. You know what, my dear girl? When things don't work out in a family, it's both your fault. Don't blame it all on one. Jill crouched on the couch from the surprise and such insolence of her mother-in-law. The look on Mrs. Leonard's face was one of anger and indignation. Tears welled up in Jill's eyes, but she immediately pulled herself together and went on the offensive. You know what, Mrs. Leonard? My only fault is that I loved your son too much. Yeah, well, what's that suitcase in the hallway? That's John's stuff in there. I had them ready for him to pick up when he thought of coming home. What, are you going to kick my son out of his own apartment? Actually, that apartment is also mine and our children's. He doesn't spend his evenings at the train station, but in bed with the girl he loves. Suddenly they were interrupted by a phone call. Is that John, her mother-in-law asked. And when Jill nodded, she held out her hand, gesturing that she wanted to talk to him herself. Son, it's mother. Where are you? Why aren't you at home with your wife and kids? Mom, what are you doing there and where is Jill, wondered John. Jill is fine. She, if anything, packed up your stuff and wants to, like Ketton, throw it out on the street. Will you answer my questions? 
Where are you? Mom, you stay out of this. Go home. I'll come over tomorrow, and my wife and I will figure it all out on our own. He disconnected, her mother-in-law returned the phone to Jill and, after saying, goodbye, quickly left the apartment. The next day, while waiting for her husband, Jill sent the children to her parents' house. She didn't want them to witness the scandal. At exactly 12 a.m. he rang the doorbell, even though he had the keys. Jill took a deep breath and opened the door. On the threshold stood John. Outwardly he was still the same, but his eyes were like those of a stranger. You didn't have to call. You've got the keys for now, Jill muttered and went into the kitchen. Her husband followed her. Happy New Year, Jill. You can still wish me new happiness, the woman smirked. They sat down at the table across from each other. Jill was silent, looking at her husband expectantly. After a little silence, he said quietly, I love her, Jill. I know it's disgusting to you and the children, but I can't be without her. Do you understand? We're interesting together. We can talk for hours about different things, and we understand each other half-heartedly. They say that's what happens when people are on the same page. Jessica and I are on the same wavelength. I know you don't want to hear this, but I want you to understand me. In a way, I'm glad it happened that way at the party. Otherwise, it would've taken me a long time to get away from you. Tell me, Jill, do you not want to let me go?" John looked her straight in the eye. Who told you that? The woman smiled, I'm glad to get rid of you and start my life with a clean slate. The only thing I want is for you to explain it to Emily yourself. And I want you to tell me why you're going to live apart now. But how am I going to explain it?" he resented, the girl will hate me. Yeah, maybe we shouldn't do this now. Give me time, I have to think, find the right words, for I love Emily very much. Well yes, that's what I figured. That's why you're going to go live with another woman. You shouldn't say that. Jessica is a very intelligent woman. Yes, I understand. That's why she got a man into bed knowing he was married and had two kids, but basically, it's not my place to moralize to you. Your suitcase is waiting for you in the hallway. I'm not keeping you any longer. I hope you have enough brains to avoid the division of property. Don't worry, I don't need anything, John smiled and left. He picked up his things he left, and she cried like a baby. Soon Jill filed for divorce. They didn't get a quick divorce, with two children, they were supposed to have time to reconcile. But no one took advantage of that, and six months later Jill and John were free men. Another year had passed since then. Jill could proudly say for herself that she had survived the ordeal and now, looking back, she had no regrets. During that year she had lost some weight, changed her haircut, and most importantly remembered how to smile. She caught men's eyes, and it flattered her. One day, while walking with her children in the mall, Jill heard a familiar voice. Hi. You look beautiful, she turned around and saw Eugene, the same detective who had once found John and helped him get his memory back. Eugene. What a pleasant surprise. What are you doing here, Jill rejoiced earnestly. I stopped in for coffee. How's life? How's John? Where is he, by the way? Why is he with you?" and the man looked around for his spouse. Don't look for him, Jill said, I'm here with the kids, and I think John's doing fine. I haven't seen him in a long time, and catching Eugene's surprised look, she added, we're separated. He couldn't be his old self, and I couldn't accept his new one. I'm sorry. I'm not at all, laughed the woman, I'm living fine. My children make me happy, so there's no need to regret the past. By the way, why are you alone? Where is your wife? Which one, he wondered. We, when we were still with John together, saw you with a girl. You were coming out of the jewelry store, and we thought you were. Oh that, laughed Eugene, so that's my sister. She got married and asked for help with the rings. Now it was Jill's turn to be surprised. Too bad, and I already wanted to congratulate you. Well, a handsome man like you shouldn't be alone for so long. 
It's not fair. So let's fix that injustice, shall we, said Eugene, looking at her intently, I told you back then that I wanted a woman like you. Jill's cheeks flushed and, embarrassed, she lowered her eyes. I'm too old for you, you need a girl about 10 years younger. Why? What am I going to do with her? Well, for one thing, she's more energetic. And she can also give you a baby, Jill said all this while she caught herself thinking that she wouldn't mind being with him. There was a calmness and confidence that came from him. He was very polite, very courteous, which once again proved his decency. As if reading her thoughts, he asked. Jill, would it be possible for me to come and visit you sometime? Of course, Eugene. I'd love to see you. At this point they parted ways. But a couple of days later he called her and said again that he would like to come over if she wasn't busy. When Jill opened the door, she couldn't even see him behind all the boxes and packages. There were toys for the children, fruit, cake, flowers, candy. He introduced himself to the children and handed out gifts. As the satisfied children scattered, he approached Jill. Good to see you. And not just today. It's good to see you every day, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. This is for you, and handing her the bouquet, he kissed her on the cheek. Her scent made his head spin, and he couldn't resist running his hand through her hair, feeling it silky and soft. I'm sorry, but I can't help myself, come into the room, Jill said, I'll just put the flowers in a vase. The evening went beautifully. They dined, drank wine, and reminisced a great deal. They sat up late and when it was time to put the children to bed, Eugene scurried home. Can I come visit again, he asked, standing at the threshold. Eugene, don't ask. I enjoy your company very much. Without agreeing, they embraced. He said, goodbye, but how he hated to leave her. He should not hurry, otherwise it would be easy to spoil everything. As time went on. Jill and Eugene began to see each other. She often went to visit him, stayed overnight, leaving the children with their mother. One day while eating breakfast, Eugene said, When we live here together, we can rearrange things the way you want. I, if anything, won't mind at all. Eugene, you're a grown man and you should understand that I'm not going anywhere without my children, I'm not leaving them for my mother. Did I ask for that, he wondered, we'll all live together as one big family. But there's too little room in your two-room apartment for four people. Emily is big and needs her own room, and John is growing up too. If things work out between you and me, then dash. What do you mean, if, the man interrupted her, we've already made it work, Jill. And where we're going to live isn't the main thing at all. The main thing is with you and forever, he smiled and took her palm in his, and gently touched her fingers with his lips. There is one more problem, said Jill, he looked at her carefully, Eugene, you understand that due to my age I will not be able to give birth to you, I am already 38 years old. You want your child, and your parents are waiting for your grandchildren. I have no parents. They died. My aunt brought me up. And when she was gone, they put me in an orphanage, so I'm an independent person. If there are no children together, then for me will be your family. Anything that is yours is especially dear to me. Have I made myself clear? Don't you worry, I love you and I want to be with you. When Jill came home, her mother didn't ask her anything. It was surprising. Aren't you at all interested, smiled Jill. Interested, replied her mother, smiling back, I'm interested in the date of the wedding and what to get you. There's no need to ask anything, daughter, you can see it all right in your face. Only a fool cannot see. Jill laughed, but suddenly became serious when she saw the bouquet of flowers on the table. What are those, she asked. The woman was quiet for a while, and then said quietly. John came by. He wanted to see you. He looks so miserable, Jill, you can see that not everything is going well in his new life. I don't care, she waved her hand, he's made his choice, now let him think for himself. You can't do that, her mother said suddenly, maybe it's Jessica who's hurting him there. He's nervous. I'm not saying you should let him come back and all that, 
but you could call and find out exactly what he wanted. He is, after all, the father of his children and not a stranger to you. Okay, I'll call, Jill sighed, let's go get some tea. The next day she called John. He asked her to meet him. She did not invite him home, and they agreed to meet at a cafe, where they used to like to relax. He did look like a beaten dog, his eyes dulled. When he saw Jill, he smiled and wanted to kiss her on the cheek, but she wouldn't let him. Why did you come, she asked immediately as he sat down across from her. You look nice, John said quietly, as if he hadn't heard her question. Thank you, I wish I could say the same about you. You didn't answer. John, what did you come here for? I wanted to say good. Bye. He smiled sadly, I'm leaving. I was invited to work in the main scientific center of the country. They're giving me an apartment there. And you thought this would be a good opportunity to start over with Jessica, wondered Jill. No, Jessica left me. She's now working with the CEO as head of the department. And I was offered to be her deputy, can you imagine? But I turned it down and wrote a letter of resignation. Jill looked at him and couldn't keep the satisfied expression off her face. She knew it wasn't right, after all, the man was in trouble. But inside, the woman was jubilant that life had punished her ex-husband. I came by once, John continued, I wanted to ask you back. I know I shouldn't have, you probably wouldn't have accepted me. But I wanted to at least try. And then I saw you walking on your arm with Eugene, that detective. You were so happy, and I didn't interfere with your happiness. You deserved it. Jill. Living with Jessica, I realized what kind of woman I had lost. You made me look like an idiot. But I can't get it back now. And when I was offered to work in the capital, I did not even think. I said yes, right away. I'm sorry, Jill said quietly, but it was your choice then. Yes, I completely understand. I also wanted to ask, Jill, when Emily finishes school. Then I'll offer her an apprenticeship in the capital at once. And if she says yes, don't discourage her. I'll help her there. You know it's a good opportunity for our girl, especially with her knowledge. All right, Jill smiled, I won't talk her out of it, but if she agrees to your offer, I won't talk her out of it either. She's an adult and should decide for herself. Thank you. They chatted some more. John talked about his mother-in-law, about his brother who had recently married, and they parted like old, good acquaintances. Jill's spirits were light. On March 8, Eugene decided to propose to her. He came home, inviting her parents there beforehand. The man warned them that he was going to propose. He asked them to keep everything a secret from Jill. The man wanted to surprise his beloved woman. When everyone was seated at the table, Eugene poured champagne by the glass, congratulated all the girls on International Women's Day, and suddenly, looking at Jill's parents, he became serious and said, Mr. Gordon and Mrs. Gordon. I love your daughter, and I want to spend the rest of my life with her. I promise not to hurt her, to take care of her, to help her, and to do whatever I can to make Jill happy. And from you, Emily, I want to ask for your mother's hand in marriage, too. What's that got to do with me, she wondered. I want everyone to be okay, with my proposal. We'll all have to live together now, unless, of course, you and your mother don't mind. Emily looked at her mother and smiled. Mother, do you want to marry Uncle Eugene yourself? Jill nodded. Yes, I love him very much, daughter. Well, then I don't mind either. I want my mother to be happy, Emily replied, looking at Eugene, but there is one condition, the man looked closely at the girl, Uncle Eugene, I will not call you daddy. I'm a big girl now. I have a father, and I love him. I think you must understand me. He nodded, walked over to the girl, put his arms around her and kissed her on the top of her head and whispered. Thank you, I understand everything. I won't let you down. Then he took out a velvet box and put a lovely ring on Jill's finger. When everyone was seated and more or less settled down, Jill's father inquired, Where will you be staying, Eugene? 
Well, I think here, if Jill doesn't mind. And my apartment can be rented, Eugene shared his thoughts. Jill nodded, adding. Yeah, your apartment is going to be a little crowded for all of us. Great, said Emily, but I'm leaving for the capital soon. Daddy and I have already talked it over, so you'll have another room at your disposal. I'll only be coming for the vacations. Jill was at once a little sad, which could not escape her daughter's attentive gaze. She hugged her mother and said, Don't be sad, it's still a year and a half before I leave. You will have time to get used to the idea. And in general, it's time to learn to let your children go, she smiled, that's what one psychologist says. The wedding of Eugene and Jill was not noisy, there were the closest people. On the groom's side came his cousin and her husband, and on the bride's side were her parents and a few girlfriends with their husbands. Jill was a beauty. Dressed in a beautiful light-colored suit, she looked elegant. The discreet makeup only accentuated her flawless skin and huge eyes. As she picked up her lipstick, she heard. Don't paint your lips, or I'll smear it all over when I kiss you, Eugene asked guiltily. Okay, she agreed, and thought to herself that her mother hadn't allowed her to paint her lips before, and now her husband was doing it. Don't you know why I'm nervous, asked Jill, hugging her future spouse. You're not the only one. My hands are shaking too, look, her fiancé reassured her. After the wedding, her husband hugged Jill. That's it, you're mine now. Say you're mine. I'm yours, you're mine, the woman smiled. I became yours years ago as soon as you walked into my office. Then I fell in love at once. And now you're a married woman, my woman. An amazing story, isn't it? Thank you for listening till the end. I sincerely hope that you truly enjoyed it. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and rate this video. See you in the comments and in new releases.